is called Calvary, and that person is called Jesus. Well, let me uh, ask you, did you hear about the lightning bug that got run over by a lawnmower? Well, he was delighted. <laughs> let me say I am delighted to be back here. I think I've been here six times. I came here, first of all, uh, Pat Kilby, I believe, was a revival service. And then I was here this past Wednesday night, heard Brother Vinny. And then last Sunday morning, I heard Pastor Timmy. And then last Sunday night, we were here with the bowling family. And uh, there was one other time there. But anyway, I am delighted to be with you. And I appreciate so very much. Is everything all right there? All right. But I'm delighted to be with you today. Now... This is the first time in a long, long time that I've had the opportunity or responsibility of speaking three times, and I hope and trust my voice will last uh, through the message tonight, and I hope you'll be back tonight if at all possible. But uh, many years ago when I first entered the ministry and started preaching, I was a Methodist for 19 years, and, um, but then I became a Baptist after my first year in college at Campbell University. I have been a Baptist pastor and a short-term missionary and evangelist. And by God's grace, and let me say by God's grace, he took a farm boy from Richmond County, a cotton farmer, tobacco farmer. And uh, I have lived in five states. I've traveled in 50 states. And by God's grace, I have been in 46 different countries since uh, 1960 when I was saved and born again. So thank you for this opportunity. That, uh, I thank God first, and then I thank Pastor uh, uh, Timmy for this opportunity. And I just want to share with you from the Word of God and from my heart and from how God has uh, used me in a small way here and there around the world. And I'm just glad to be at uh, Piney Grove Chapel Baptist Church. How many are glad you're here today? Say amen. amen. How many would rather be here in the best hospital in North Carolina? Say, All right. Thank God for your health and pray for those who are out in the hospital and those who are sick. And also pray for those who are lost. Now this morning I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of 2 Timothy. We're going to look at two passages in that book. Uh, last letter that Paul wrote, he was writing to his son in the faith, Timothy. There are three books that Paul, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. I've probably read those more than any three books in the Bible. And it's all addressed to young preachers and I remember when I started preaching back in the early, well, really about 1960, 61, 59 years ago, believe it or not, and uh, I read a, a book on preaching by Clovis Chapel, Methodist minister, outstanding, very popular, author of many books. He said the sermon that's not worth preaching the second time was not worth preaching the first time. So I don't know whether I preached this morning was worth hearing the second time, but some of you, like myself, are here in the early service as well as this one. Let me give you the topic and then the text. Second Timothy chapter 2, and then we're going to look over in chapter 4. But uh, the title we want to use today is, What on Earth is a Christian? What on Earth is a Christian? Now, we could get a lot of answers and a lot of responses to what that is, but let me give you something that I believe might be helpful to you as far as understanding what uh, a Christian is. And if you'd like to honor God's word by standing as I read, please feel free to do so. Just right there, we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. We'll read the first seven verses, then we'll skip over to chapter 4. If you're there, say amen. amen. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. 
He wants to please his commanding officer. A similar way Paul says, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. And it's going to be amazing how God's going to give you insight of what we are reading here today in addition to what I say. Chapter 4, verse 5. Paul says, But you, you Timothy, keep your head in all situations. Now that's good advice. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. May God add to the blessing of the reading of his word. You may be seated. So what on earth is a Christian? Richard Baxter, the old outstanding Puritan preacher, once said this. I preach as never to preach again as a dying man to dying men. As I get older, and have preached thousands of times here and yonder, as I get older, I realize that one of these days, I probably am going to preach my last sermon. But I think it's very important that we not only preach sermons, but that we live out sermons. It is very important that we put into practice what God has instructed us to do and become. So, I preach as never to preach again, as a dying man to dying men. So listen, listen, pay close attention. God has something to say. God has something to say to you and you and you and you and to all of us, and God has something to say to me. The greatest miracle I ever experienced in my life was on April the 6th, 1960. When I was 12 years of age, I was baptized in the Jones Springs United Methodist Church there outside of a small town called Ellerby down in Richmond County, Rockingham's a county seat. 12 years of age, I joined the church. Two years later, as I got older and got more sinful, I went with my friend Ralph Carricker to a Baptist revival and lo and behold, I'm sitting back there at the back, my friend walked down the aisle, I walked down the aisle, made a decision there at the age of 14. Well, it lasted for about two weeks. Two years later, at the age of 16, I went with a group of young people from my high school to Charlotte to hear a dynamic, flaming evangelist by the name of Billy Graham, 1958 in September. I walked the aisle in a Billy Graham crusade. Now, you'd think after joining the Baptist Church, or Methodist Church, and going forward in a Baptist revival and walking forward in a Bab uh, Billy Graham crusade, I'd be on my way to heaven. But it was not until one night my high school Bible teacher witnessed to me, and I saw the light like I've never seen it before. She asked me a very simple question. She said, Jack, why did Jesus die? Here I am, a senior in high school, taking my second year of Bible, and member of the Bible club. I knew what the answer was intellectually. But I tried, 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 kept striking out spiritually. And she said, why did Jesus die? And in that moment, all I could see is a beautiful blue sky and Jesus hanging on the cross, looking straight at me, almost saying personally, I am doing this for you. That night, I made a commitment to Jesus. I surrendered my life, one of my favorite songs, all to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I fully give. I will ever love and trust Him and His presence daily live. And I date that night is my born again experience. I made a surrender to God that I'd go anywhere He wanted me to go. I'd do anything He wanted me to do, be anything He wanted me to be, and say anything He wanted me to say. And by God's grace, I've been doing that. I've been to Pakistan three times, been to Cuba two times, I've been to North Korea, and it's hard to find anybody that's preached and spoken in North Korea. When I was there, my guide took me to the Bangsu Church, 
and the pastor asked me to come up and share at the end of the service. I went up and spoke about five minutes. Well, anyway, I wasn't a part of the tour. I was the only tourist who had two tour guides. And when I left, my tour guide said to me, he said, you're the only third American that's ever spoken in this church. He said, Billy Graham spoke here, and Franklin Graham spoke here, and you spoke here today. I said, well, we have two things in common. We're all from North Carolina, and we all love Jesus. Well, that was a great experience. But I don't have the time to tell you how God has led and directed, and I thank God the journey's not over yet. You know, Paul says, for me to live is Christ, for me to die is gain. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so it is very important that you be born again, born of the Spirit, born from above. And so what on earth is a Christian? I was born in 1942. At that time, there were only 2.3 billion people in the world. Today, there are 7.7 billion. There's more than 5 billion more people living on planet earth this morning than there were on the day that I was born physically. And God took the world out of my heart in 1960. He put the world on my heart. And as long as I live and, and know Christ, I am going to be doing everything I can to see people come to Jesus. And the 7.7 billion, billion, billion people in the world, approximately 33% profess to be Christian. Now over 2 billion of them, I believe, are Roman Catholics. And then you've got the Eastern Orthodox, like the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, the Albanian Orthodox, the Romanian Orthodox. And then you have the Protestant denominations. And then you have what I call the Evangelical denominations, which could be some of the same Protestant denominations. And then you have what we call Marginal. Marginal would be like the Jehovah's Witnesses, like the Mormons. I've got a little bit of everything in my family background. I was the seventh of eight children. My grandfather studied with the Jehovah's Witnesses. I've got my brother married, my second grade school teacher, and she was a Presbyterian. My younger brother became a Catholic. I have two sisters that became Mormons. My mother and dad were Methodists, and I almost became a Confucius. <laughs> and then when I became a Southern Baptist, they thought I really was confused. But let me say, I love the Baptists. I love evangelical Christians. I have preached in Pakistan to, in a Roman Catholic church. I have preached in the Salvation Army. I have preached in the Church of Pakistan, which is a merger of three denominations. I have preached in a Pentecostal church, and I have preached in a Presbyterian church, and I have preached in the Western Methodist church. I tell people I'll speak in a Muslim mosque or a Jewish synagogue if you want me to, or on a street corner. And so in John 3, 16, we have the gospel. Let's say it together. For God... To love the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now I, I think it was one of our leading pastors, David Jeremiah, that said in that one verse you have the gospel. God's only son perish everlasting life. And so that's the gospel. If you know nothing more than John 3, 16, you have a gospel worth sending around the world. And my dear friends, all of us can share that. The word Christian, what on earth is a Christian? The word Christian is mentioned only three times in the New Testament. Now the word disciple is mentioned like 224 times. Now when I think of evangelism, I talk about discipleship evangelism. And so discipleship is very important. Christians were called in the early days believers. They were called disciples. They were called brethren, people of the way. They were called saints. They were called the elect. But they were first called Christians in Antioch. That's the first reference. And that is in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. The Bible says, and uh, they were first called Christians at Antioch. And in that word Christian, this church at Antioch, they were sending missionaries like Paul and Barnabas and Paul and Silas. They were sending missionaries to go into the, all the nations of the world. Now the second reference to Christian, 1126, 
when the Christians were sending missionaries is over in chapter 26, verse 28. When Paul, toward the end of his life, came back to Jerusalem, the Jews got so infuriated with what he was doing as a former Pharisee of the Pharisees and preaching and teaching Christ, and he gave his testimony there in chapter 26, and, there, and when he did, the Jews came and put him in jail and were about ready to put him to death, and 40 men made a vow they would not eat nor drink until Paul was dead. And so that night, his nephews, his sister's son, came and informed the Roman government. So that night, with a large cavalry, they took him over to the city of Caesarea, and he was imprisoned there for two years before he went to Rome. But there, Festus the governor, had uh, the Herod Agrippa paid a visit to the governor, and the governor of Festus says, we've got a man here that they arrested. He has done nothing to deserve imprisonment. He has done nothing to deserve death. And I want you to hear about this man. Herod said, I'd like to hear him myself. So the next morning, guess what? This Paul gets up in court and he gives his testimony of how he came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then Herod Agrippa said, he says, Paul, are you thinking a short time you can convince me to be a Christian? That's the second time it's ever used. First time at Antioch, second time there in the courtroom. And here you have a witness for Christ. Not only uh, they were sending missionaries, but here you have a witness seeking to save a very high political figure in the Roman Empire. And here's what Paul said. Sir, King Herod Agrippa, I would that all men were just like I am, and that is a Christian, except for these chains and the bonds that I've had. And so there, Paul, that's a second reference to the word Christian. What on earth is a Christian? A Christian is sending missionaries to the world. What is a Christian? It's someone seeking to win anyone to Jesus that's an unbeliever. Let me give you the third re reference. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. Now, Peter writes and says, If you suffer as a Christian, all of the apostles died a martyr's death with the exception of John, and he had been banished on the Isle of Patmos. You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who opposed Nazism back in the, the days of Hitler, wrote a book, you know, about uh, the cost of discipleship. And this Lutheran pastor, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, said this, When Jesus bids a man to come, he bids him to come and die. I am convinced that every true Christian ought to be willing to die for Christ, but also live for Christ as well. And so Peter says, if you suffer as a Christian, and Jesus says, all those who of my disciples will suffer persecution and rejection. Now put that on your refrigerator. That's a promise. And we need to stay in close connection with our Lord and our Master. Now, let me, I'm going to give you four words in Paul's writing that we read that describes a Christian. So let's look at what in the world is a Christian. Number one, he's a soldier that pleases his commanding officer. Now, Paul says here to Timothy, he says, be a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are three things he mentions there. Number one, you ought to be serving your, uh, your, uh, your officer, commanding officer. You ought to not only serve, but you ought to suffer the cross, the death, persecution. And number three, you need to separate yourself from the world. As a soldier, and thank God for our soldiers. Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Coast Guard, and everything else. The Marines. Let's never get to a place in this country we don't honor our veterans. I've dealt with too many families through the years since 19, early 60s who had a son that died in World War II or World War, World War I or, or some other war that we fought. My dear friends, those young men and young women that go across to Afghanistan and to other parts of the world, and they give their lives and sometimes come back mentally and emotionally broken, we need to honor them in any and every way that we possibly can. But I want you to know that Paul says, what on earth is a Christian? A Christian is a person who pleases 
his commanding officer. I live with one purpose in my life. That is when the journey is over and I stand before the Lord, regardless of what people said or good or bad about me, that I stand before the Lord. I want to hear these words from my commanding officer. Well done, my good servant. Well done, my good and faithful servant. We are to be faithful unto death. I have make no apologies for saying, what on earth is a Christian... He is a soldier that seeks to please his commanding officer. And Jesus is our commanding officer. What he says we ought to believe and when he sins we ought to do. I remember growing up, don't ever hear it much anymore, singing in the Methodist church, that Methodist hymnal, that Cokesbury hymnal for Thomas Coke and Francis Asbury. Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ the royal master leads against the foe, forward into battle, see his banner go. What on earth is a Christian? The soldier wants to please his commanding officer. Number two, right below that, Paul uses the word athlete. He says in a similar way to a soldier, an athlete plays by the rules. The athlete is like a, a Christian is like an athlete, and the athlete plays by the rules. You break the rules, you get penalized. If you don't believe it, ask Pete Rose. 4,600 something hits, the most ever of any Major League Baseball player, but when he got involved in gambling on games he was involved with, he was banned from the Hall of Fame. My dear friends, there's a, sometimes you can be in the Hall of Shame instead of the Hall of Fame. And so you got to keep the rules. Jesus, the Lord gives us ten commandments. If we can just live by those ten over that Moses gave us, uh, that would just change the whole world. You wouldn't have to lock your doors at night. You wouldn't have to do a lot of things we have to do today. I remember I played three years in the American Legion Baseball in Richmond County post-49. But before every game, we'd line up the home team, the visiting team, down the first and third base uh, lines, and we would uh, repeat the sportsmanship code, and here's what it says. As we stood there with hats off, I will keep the rules. I will keep faith with my teammates. I will keep my temper. I've discovered nobody else wants it. I'll keep my temper. I will keep fit. I will keep a stout heart in defeat. I will keep my pride under in victory. I will keep a sound soul, a clean mind, a healthy body, so help me God. And then we would sing the national anthem, put on our cap, get out and play baseball. I thank God for those values from the American Legion that I repeat a game after game after game. You know, the Bible says, be thou faithful unto life and death, and God will give you a crown of life. Do you realize there are five different crowns that in the Bible that the Bible speaks of. First of all, there is the, the crown. There's a crown of, uh, that's incorruptible. There's a crown of rejoicing. There's a crown of um, life. There's a crown of righteousness. And there's a crown of glory. I remember you used to sing an old song, Will there be any stars in my crown? My friends, we find, I believe it's in the book of Revelation, that when we stand before the Lord and if he has given us any kind of crown, we're going to take those crowns and lay them at the feet of Jesus. And that's the reason when those songs I still remember crown him with many crowns. And that's what we ought to do, is give praise to Jesus, give honor to Jesus, give our love to Jesus, give our devotion to Jesus because it's all because of him. So what on earth is a Christian? He's a soldier that wants to please his commanding officer. He's an athlete that plays by the rules. Let me say thirdly, what on earth is a Christian? He's a farmer. He's a farmer that plants the seed and reaps the harvest. Now, I grew up in Richmond County. My dad was a tenant farmer before he got married to my mother in 1924. He had a seventh grade education. He worked with two or three men there in the Derby community. And looked there until he, uh, as long as he was able, and died at the age of 90. 
All I knew was the cotton field, the sweet potato patch, the tobacco field. We raised oats and corn and okra and cantaloupes and strawberries, anything and everything. I was a farm boy. But you know what? I didn't love that kind of life. And I got to thinking, all work and no play makes Jack a very dull boy. So somehow, I got involved in playing football, basketball, baseball, nine months out of the year at Ellaby High School. Because my heart was not in the farm, even though I appreciate farmers. I learned lessons that I'd never learned in any other way. My dad was a man that worked hard, worked long. He would never work on Sunday. Six days, he was a believer in the scriptures. Out in the field, he would quote the scripture verses to us. Words like, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Go to the slugger, thy aunt, and consider her ways, lays up, and so forth. I thought he said, go and be a slugger, you know, but instead of be a, there's a big difference between a slugger and a sluggard. <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, I'd do about anything and everything to get off that farm. You know, I think Gore Clark has a song, I never picked cotton, but my mother did, my sister did, my daddy, my mother, my daddy died young in the coal mines. By the way, he died not long ago. He lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I spent my last 10 years. So what on earth is a Christian? He's a farmer that plants the seed and reaps the harvest. And here Paul says that the hardworking farmer ought to share in the first fruits of the crops. And Jesus says, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers of few pray that the Lord will send forth laborers into the harvest. And may I say I'm very, I'm very blessed to know how you reach people. Pastor Timmy, I asked him the other day, how many baptisms would you average here year by year pretty much? And he said about 50. He said, we've led the association about a third of the years that I've been pastor here. I thank God for evangelistic pastors. My dear friends, I see... I see churches. When I went to Oklahoma in 1964 as a summer missionary, I preached in five churches in five counties and five locations, two weeks there. And every one of those churches had zero baptisms the last year. When I went to Oklahoma as a summer missionary, we were out there trying to reach people for Christ. May I say to you that evangelism has practically died in a lot of our churches. And that's the reason we're closing about six to 10,000 churches every year. I see churches that used to run 1,300 in Bible study, now they're down to 150. And what has happened, we've lost the evangelistic zeal and the evangelism experience. My dear friends, every church that's going to be true to Jesus and the apostles and the Word of God will be evangelical. And if you're not, you're missing the mark. Jesus came to die for sinners. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of all nations. He said, baptize them and teach them everything that I commanded you. My dear friends, I want to be associated with a church and people and Christians that are, that are evangelical. So what on earth is a Christian? He's a farmer that plants the seed. Jesus says, one will plant, another will water, but it's God that gives the increase. It's sad in our Southern Baptist Convention of 47,000 churches across America that we have over 10,000 churches that baptize a grand total of zero together. Junior Hill figured out one day how many songs have been sung, how many prayers have been prayed, how many dollars have been given in tithes and offerings, how many messages have been preached. And nobody's saved. It breaks my heart when I read that 30 thousand plus southern baptist churches do not baptize one single young person in a year 35 or thousand southern baptist churches when they count up their baptisms at the end of the year they got zero young people my friends as long as i'm able i'm going to be keep preaching and doing what i'm talking about this morning so what on earth is a christian a christian is a person where the um a soldier who wants to please his commanding officer. He is not only a soldier, he's an athlete that plays by the rules. And then thirdly, he is a farmer that plants the seed and harvests the crop. And number four, Paul says, Timothy, keep your head in all situations. I've seen a lot of Baptist preachers and a lot of Baptist people lose their heads in business meetings and other times. He says, do the work of an evangelist. 
I don't believe any Christian is exempt from being evangelical, evangelistic, and seeking to win his neighbor, his family, his friends, and bring them to Christ. The evangelist presents, portrays, and persuades unbelievers to repent of their sin, believe in the Lord Jesus, be born again, and come into the kingdom of God. Jesus said to Nicodemus three times, you must be born again, you must be born again, you must be born again. Jesus said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. He's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So I'm not going to leave you like orphan children. The Holy Spirit's going to be with you. He will empower you. He'll guide you. He'll instruct you. And you need to be filled with the Spirit. So let me say here in summary, what on earth is a Christian? He's a soldier, an athlete, a farmer, an evangelist. Now, I sort of like acronyms, S-A-F-E, S for soldier, A for athlete, F for farmer, E, evangelist. That spells a word called safe. Once saved, always safe. Amen? Once saved, always safe. I remember growing up, my dad used to speak of Billy Sunday. Now, Billy Sunday was a Billy Graham of the first 20 years of the 20th century. And he was quite a, quite a character. He was born in Iowa. I think his father died in the Confederate War, in, you know, the Civil War. His father died from Iowa. His mother was a godly woman. He was an athlete, good athlete, played professionally baseball for about eight or ten years with Chicago, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia. But uh, he, like many athletes, can get successful and get out there and get with the wrong kind of people, drinking, carousing, and things like that. And he was in, went, walked by one Sunday afternoon on a day off in Chicago, and he went by the Pacific Garden Mission, and he heard the people singing, Where is my wandering boy tonight? Where is my wandering boy tonight? He came under conviction from hearing that song and remembered the prayers of his mother. So Billy Sunday very soon started attending church, gave up baseball, and became one of the most dynamic preachers in his generation. They called it the Sawdust Trail where people came down the aisle to be saved. And so here is Billy Sunday. He was a great opponent. Of, he was very pro, prohibition. And he was very active, and, and he would do things strange. Like he would take a chair and beat it to just smithereens and say, I'll fight the liquor traffic until hell freezes over. So he was a great promoter of prohibition. Well, you know, historically, that didn't last too long. But anyway, Charles Howard, whom I live with in Campbell College, and he preached my ordination sermon. And Charles Howard tells him back in the 30s, I believe it was, when Billy Sunday came to Raleigh to preach, and he went to Hill. And he had about decided to give up going to Wake Forest College and going into the ministry because he didn't have any money. And he was about ready to quit and just throw in the towel. And he sat up there in the balcony in the music auditorium there in Raleigh back in the 30s. He said, right in the middle of his sermon, Billy Sunday looked up there. He said, young man, if you fail God, somebody's going to hell. Charles Howard, by his own testimony, says Billy Sunday didn't know he was up there, but God knew he was up there. And God's message came to him very straight and clear. Now, I say to you, if you... Fail God, somebody's going to hell. Where do you start? You start with your family. You start with your friends. You start with your neighbors. You start with your loved ones. And you live the gospel as well as preach the gospel. Billy Sunday, he was known to do strange things. He'd come sliding into the pulpit, jump up there and say, Safe! Safe! Well, he was different. I don't try that kind of preaching. But he was safe. The words I like most that I've picked up from Billy Sunday through the years, and I'll share them with you. Live the Christian life. Live the Christian life. Men will admire you. Women will respect you. Little children will love you. And God will crown your life with success. And when the twilight of your life mingles with the purpling dawn of eternity, men will speak your name in honor. And baptize your grave with tears when God attunes for you the evening chimes of light. Like Charles Howard used to say, when the big show starts up yonder, don't be in hell.